and still do this. I want to thank JR and all of you for asking me to be here. It's amazing how far you all have come, and it's amazing how far Covenant has come. The first sermon I really preached at Covenant, JR alluded to, uh, Pastor was ill. And he called me on Wednesday night and said, I'm not going to be there on Sunday. And I called John Hankins and I said, John, we are taking over the church on Sunday. <laughs> I'm doing the morning service and you're doing the evening service. And we had three days to pull it together. So, we are extremely grateful to be here, Shirley and I. My birthday often falls on Gay Pride Day. And I think it's just lovely of y'all to give me that for <laughs> I want to thank a couple of people for being here today that you probably don't know, but they met in the choir and they have been there, been there for me ever since. Diane Tish and Lainey and Debbie Tate, where are they? They're back there. They're from out of town, so it's good to see them and know that they have come all this way to be here this morning. I spent 11 years in New Orleans when my kids were young. I was one of the first white teachers in the previously all-black school system. They called us crossover teachers, teachers who were willing to get out of their comfort zone and go into the opposite race. I taught for nearly 11 years. And while we lived in New Orleans, we had lots of chances to go to parades, Mardi Gras parades especially. When I first got back to New York, which is where I'm from, I was in Greenwich Village and noticed that people seemed to be massing for a parade. The only thing I had read about gay pride was a little article in Time Magazine in New Orleans. And here I was, standing on the corner where Stonewall Inn was as the parade mask, my first gay pride back in New York. I was watching, and the key word there is watching. I had been applying for teaching jobs and wouldn't have been caught on camera at a gay pride parade. Chances of that, by the way, were one in 400,000. <laughs> what did I know? I've often said that I found gay pride, feminism, and metropolitan community church all in the same week, and my life has never been the same. Amen. A year later, a group of us women from MCC were marching in the parade wearing t-shirts that said on the back, God is a dyke's best friend. <laughs> I was carrying the banner, you know these long banners, and you can hold them in front of you and hide behind them. That's the banner I was carrying. A year after that, I was a marshal along the parade route and pinned an I am a lesbian Christian pin to the seat of the pants of a protester who was carrying a seven foot high banner and couldn't get it off his pants because he was fielding a headwind that would have torn it out of his hands. So he walked the whole parade route 
saying that he was a Christian lesbian. <laughs> A year later, Missy and I walked at the head of the parade, and Troy Perry, Missy is my daughter, she's back there, Elizabeth, she and I walked at the head of the parade when Troy Perry was the Grand Marshal. Just as my journey as a gay person took years, so had my faith journey. At 16, I stood on the steps of Marble Collegiate Church in New York and told my dad he was a hypocrite, everybody in the church was a hypocrite, I wasn't going to be a hypocrite, and I was out of there. I thought forever. Many years and too many drunken episodes went by until coming home one day after drinking supper, I passed by the First Baptist Church of New York, and they were singing. The hymn sounded familiar, and I stumbled up the steps and heard the words to Lord, I'm coming home. Mm -hmm. That was the beginning of my work towards sobriety and my floundering journey back to Christianity. A dear elderly co-worker at the clinic I worked at in New Orleans offered to pick me up with my two small sons for Sunday school and church if I wanted to go. I went because I liked her and probably because I didn't want to hurt her feelings. I found God again in that Southern Baptist Church. I've always said, and you've probably heard me say it, that I was raised so conservatively that when I found the Southern Baptist, I thought I'd found freedom. <laughs> I went back, and this time there was one other woman. 
a Catholic nun, who probably felt as much out of place as I did. <laughs> but I walked her home and asked some of the many questions that I had. How could you be gay and a Christian? What was this church for gay people all about? How old was it? Where did it start? But my main question was, how can I be gay and a Christian? And realized that this was the 70s. This was so early. MCC had only started in 68. I was Nicodemus. How can you go back into your mother's womb and be born again? How does this work? I had been going to church for years then. I had gone back to school, gotten a degree from both Tulane and Southern Baptist Seminary in New Orleans. I've been a Sunday school teacher, superintendent of a Sunday school, and religious education director. But I had never questioned how I could be gay and Christian. I never dreamed that both were possible. I used to hide. Missy will tell you that I used to wear a wig to church. <laughs> Curly wig. So they wouldn't know that really under it I had a short gay hair. <laughs> Jersey Brass. I was religious in every sense of the word, except I wasn't honest. I was again like Nicodemus. He was a Pharisee. He had made a promise before three others that he would, to the best of his ability, keep every one of the rules and regulations that went with the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch. There were 4,000 and some of them. He would not only keep the law itself, but every ramification of the law that these 400 and 4,300 and some uh, rules and regulations insisted on. For example, the Ten Commandments say that we must remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy and no work should be done. But to a Pharisee, that meant absolutely no work. None. So for generations, Jews like Nicodemus had tried to figure out what was work. Okay? What was work? Well, for them, the kind of thing they did was to tie a knot on the Sabbath was work. Okay? But a knot had to be defined. A sailor or a camel driver couldn't tie a knot. That was work. On the other hand, if you could untie the knot with one hand, that wasn't work. <laughs> a woman could tie the sash around her garment or tie a potato in a piece of, of clothing. That was modesty and not work. You could tie the string of your sandals or tie up a skin on wine or oil. But here's where it gets weird. Suppose you wanted to let down a bucket into a well on the Sabbath. You couldn't tie a rope to it because that was work. But you could tie a woman's sash to it. To Nicodemus, 
Those were the kinds of questions that were life and death. That was his religion. That was serving God. And then the Christians came along and codified St. Paul and made a new set of laws. And we got stuck with Romans 1 and all the things that go with it. By the time I got to MCC, I was pretty religious. I knew everything Baptists believed. I had a degree from a Baptist school. I was pretty well educated in religion. But I was still scared and high. I didn't know how to be gay and Christian. It took Sister Constance, a Catholic, and my new pastor, Roy Bircher, patiently teaching me the working of the Holy Spirit. I had heard the words a million times, but I never really applied them to me. I had been born of water. Oh yes, I was an immersed Baptist. <laughs> but I didn't realize the importance and the meaning of something as simple as John 3.16. It wasn't up to me. Jesus had done it all. And all I had to do was believe and the Holy Spirit would be the rest. You know the verse. For God so loved the world, all of us, that he gave the only begotten so that everyone who believes shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen. And I heard like it was the first time the next verse. For God did not send Jesus into the world to condemn the world, yeah. yes. but that through him the world might be saved. Amen. Yes. In the same month, I became a gay Christian, a feminist, and an activist. There was no way I was going to keep this new knowledge to myself. Because of my education, I felt and found myself in demand as a Bible teacher, particularly the Old Testament. I went to work in the church office because I knew how to type a stencil. <laughs> <laughs> I took over typing the church bulletin and finally started taking seminary classes at New York Theological School and the Cathedral of St. John the Divine. I became what was then known as an exhorter, student clergy. From being scared to death, I became an activist. And I have an old picture in a magazine called The Gay Christian of myself at a democratic convention bearing a sign that said in very large letters, I am a Christian lesbian. The Bible says that after Jesus was crucified, Nicodemus was the one who provided the myrrh and spices to anoint the body. But I wanted to serve the living Christ. Amen. So what did I find out from Nicodemus? While I found a new career and a new faith, I found something more. I found a God of love who loves us more than we can imagine. Yes. I found out that eternal life isn't pie in the sky later on, by and by. Eternal life is in the here and now, yeah. and that it colors everything we do and every relationship we enter into. Yes. I found peace with God. And after a long time, peace with other people. <laughs> I found out that being forgiven means you have to forgive. 
I found out that I could really understand having peace with life. I found out that I had no reason to keep resenting a truly messed up childhood, which is another whole song. <laughs> and lastly, I found peace within myself. I could be a gay Christian, the best kind of gay person I could be, and the best kind of Christian I could be. And if I messed up, well, God wasn't there to condemn me, Amen. but to find me and put me back on the path. Amen. And finally, it gave me a new goal. Remember Isaiah? I went in Nicodemus and came out Isaiah. <laughs> there he was in the temple when he had a vision of God. A mighty, powerful explosion of a vision. He saw God high and lifted up. He saw seraphs, messengers with wings. Three sets. With two they covered their faces. With two they covered, and believe me, they clean it up in the Bible, they covered their privates. <laughs> and they were flying with the other two. And they were there to attend God and testify to God's majesty. They were singing holy, holy, holy. Just as we do in communion every Sunday. And that's where Isaiah comes in for me. I found a holy moment with God each Sunday as I learned to truly appreciate communion and the holiness of being with God each week, something I will cherish forever. As I said, I went in like Nicodemus with loads of questions, and I came out, Isaiah, singing holy, holy, holy. And when asked, whom shall I send and who will go for us, I was able to answer, here I am, Lord. Amen. Send me. Amen. We're all a little like Nicodemus. We have questions, and if you're new here, I'm sure you have millions of them. But the funny thing is that when they're answered, we become Isaiah. Yes. Whom shall I send? Send me. It's the normal progression when we're truly at home with God. We want to go to work and be Christ's hands and feet in the world. Trust me on that. I've been there. Amen. Amen.